Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I was ha I've been having some audio issues. So thank you everyone on the call. Um, thank you. So now we will get started. It's always fun, even when most your job is to do with technology, you still find yourself having basic uh, issues <laughs> regularly. Um, but good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Howell, and I'm joining you from Washington, DC. Welcome to our second Thursday talk of the year. Our Thursday talks are aiming to bring you the best and most innovative learning there is in the peace building field and beyond. If this is your first Thursday talk, well, welcome. Um, you've made some good choices uh, joining us today and um, we're glad to have you. If you're a regular participant, we're always happy to have you back. Um, as I said before, my name is Jennifer Howell. I am the Communications and Learning Officer at Search for Common Ground and the comms lead for the DME for Peace page. Um, I'll be moderating today's session. So today our discussion is focusing on why do we need another working with conflict? I am delighted to welcome Simon Fisher, who is a conflict transformation specialist, educator, and writer, among many other things, and actually one of the original co-authors of the first Working with Conflict book. We also have Vesna Matovic, a peacebuilding and conflict transformation specialist currently working with International Alert. And finally, we have Bridget Walker um, with a long career who has, sorry, who has a long career in responding to conflict with a focus now in asylum and migration policy, currently working on the advisory group of Concordus International. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today and for leading our discussion. Just a note about how we'll spend our time together. As our hosts are presenting, you can write your question using the question function on your GoToWebinar dashboard, and we will address it once we reach the Q&A portion. When you do that, also please try to write your name and affiliation if you are able. Um, with that, let me hand this over to our hosts and you can take it away. Thank you. Hello everybody and greetings. A welcome old friends and new. Uh, this little talk will be around 20 minutes. We'll share it between us. So I'm kicking off and then Vesna will take over and Bridget will end. Uh, and we'll try and set out a little bit what both what we tried to do in, in producing the new book, but also, and more important, I think, what's the thinking that went behind it? And what are the implications for our field? And we're hoping that this will in turn stimulate us, you here, to think a little bit more about what developments have been and how we need to change in relation to all the things around us. So it's a presentation which is loosely based around the publication of work, Working with Conflict, but it's primarily about what do peace builders need to know and learn now? How has this changed over the last 20 years and what does this mean for us? So, and it builds on, as this slide shows, the shoulders of so many brave practitioners and scholars. We are, in a sense, the interpreters, uh, the channels for them, some of whom we still work with um, in many parts of the world. And of course, you yourselves are some of them. So we have no pride in this, only a sense of being uh, privileged together to, 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 to voice some of the things that are happening in our field and renew the challenge to each of us to do this job that we have to do more, more successfully and effectively. So the, the, there are about six slides that I want to show you. And of course, I've jumped the first one. Just very briefly to say, why did we feel the need to to produce another Working with Conflict. The first one was published, for those who are not aware, uh, 20 years ago, 2000, uh, and uh, a number of, it's been quite widely read and, and still is, and so there was a question about why why do we need to do any more? Um, and I think there are, there are probably five reasons which I've just put up there for you. One is that there's been a lot of research and learning going on since that time. 
um, which we somehow practitioners need access to, and we haven't seen elsewhere something produced which is in the same idiom and therefore speaks to people in the same way. I think if we had, we wouldn't have wanted to pick up the metaphorical pen again. Then again, there's there's been very big changes in the context, which I'll come to in a moment, and there have been developments, therefore, in our own field, developments in relation to how we see and use power, into the uh, developments in terms of the importance of healing to our field, the crucial importance of learning and how we do it, much more thinking about dialogue and how that works and doesn't work, and then how could we write something like this without reflecting the movements for change that have been such a characteristic of the first 20 years or so. And finally, there's been a big emphasis, I think, here on, on the reflective practitioner, on ourselves. We bring ourselves into every action, and so perhaps uh, not totally typically with other fields, we need to work on ourselves uh, at the same time as we work on the context, otherwise we risk simply negating what we're trying to do. So reflexivity and reflect reflectiveness have become important elements. So the book and this session is really an invitation to a voyage of discovery. In a, in a large sense, it offers pathways, signposts, reflective questions to guide people to find their own direction, their own broad goals in whichever field they are in, where they want to bring about constructive change. And secondly, more focused frameworks, tools and techniques to help people forge their own path, develop their own strategy. At the same time, it's bringing academic and practitioner-based research together and around everyday language. And I think that's another characteristic which, which isn't very widely spread yet the sense that a lot of what we're coming up with in terms of finding in the field needs to be put out there in an accessible form um, not just in because academic language is not what everybody uses but also because many people needing this kind of material are good second language English as a second language or third language speakers so insofar as the English edition is impossible important it's it's crucial about the level of language to be uh, simplifying but not simplistic if you like sometimes so it's and it's for peace build for for yes it's for peace builders for professionalized peace builders if you like but it's also for everyone else particularly in civil society who are working for constructive change with similar values i mentioned before that the context has changed just to, to outline one or two things that that are self-evident the pandemic that we're experiencing now is drastically effective, affecting how we work and what we can do. And the, the very fact of the pandemic is demonstrating such an obvious truth of our field that one person is not safe unless everybody is safe. I mean, or the other way around, everybody's not safe and if as, as long as there's one person who isn't. Uh, we're looking at the... the uh, advanced collapse of our planetary system and loss of biodiversity which is substantially different from how it was 20 years ago a lot more inequality and exclusion coming from sort of unbridled capitalism if you like the associated growth of populism and fake news uh, associated also migration within and beyond countries and the protectionism that others put in place to defend themselves, the changing nature of warfare, and then the mass movements which we've seen all over the world in the Middle East and, and more widely and right now in Myanmar and Belarus. How do we reflect that? How do we somehow address those issues? If some of those that I've pointed to are, are, um, help, um, are not so hopeful, if you like, there are many others which are hopeful. Um, for example, the, the, the arrival of social media, which means that ordinary people can communicate with each other much more effectively. That is until governments, until close. governments close down the internet. Um, we've got many more stronger global movements, particularly around climate change. We've got the uh, increased size and diversity of civil society. Uh, we've got lots more evidence-based research into peace building, which does give our field uh, a greater certainty of moving from what we used to have to say, well, this is right to do, whether it works or not, to, well, this is 
a right to do and the evidence is that it works. And there are you know, a number of universities have been up there providing useful information, but also CDA very notably, Birkhoff, and then the Applied Conflict Transformation Studies Program, which some will know about, which is championing action research for practitioners, particularly in Asia through the Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies, uh, where people are going up to PhD using action research and then producing really valid outcomes and theoretical contributions to the field. So peace builders in all of this have become more skilled. But I think one of the questions we'd like to put out for all of us here is what has this actually meant? I mean, we've become we've become more skilled and more expert, if you like. Uh, but at the same time, uh, our observation is that peace builders have become more focused on projects, more projectized, if you like. Um, main, a lot of the peace peace building work is funded by very militaristic governments uh, who are all belonging to NATO, so they're unlikely to share our profound beliefs in peaceful slash non-violent change. How much have we lost by expanding in this way? How much has peace actually become depoliticized and become something that slots into a, a place marked this is a peace project and has lost hope of actually changing structure and the systems which give rise to endless warfare that we see in the world today and all the other things. I'm not wishing to characterize the world entirely as that, but I think it's it's undoubtedly true that the war systems are there and unchallenged largely by us as peace builders. And in addition to, to, the, to that, yeah, an effect of professionalization, I think, has been to silo us off from human rights, development, ecological workers. And maybe this needed to happen, but one of the questions in the book is how do we come back together and offer what we've got to others working for change as well? So the last piece that I want to speak to is this little map which appears early on in the book, actually comes from Diana Francis's work originally, which sets out really, it, it attempts to say, this is a scheme of where we are, a schematic map on the left, underneath violence and domination, you can see four main areas of challenge, war and other physical violence, repression, political exclusion, pollution, environmental collapse, and so on, and then exclusion, economic injustice, overconsumption, materialism, and, and those kinds of things. So those we are picturing as the clusters of issues which come under the heading of violence and domination of the, of the world. And we're trying to move towards something on the right-hand side under the heading of peace and interdependence with associated parts of what probably is our joint vision, nonviolent uh, and constructive approach to, to conflict, democracy, participation, human rights, and so on. You can see down the right-hand side. So we, we produced this because we, we wanted to raise the question of what our role is. And it comes back to this question of, are we technicians or are we transformers, uh, really? Um, in one sense, historically and, and, and importantly, we are focused on that top left hand circle, war and other physical violence. But it's not, it, it, now we are very much part uh, of the other bubbles as well. And the, we're raising the question of whether we don't have another equally important role now across the other fields where people are struggling to work for the same kind of transformation that we are. How much more could we share the expertise we have on conflict handling, conflict transformation, because all of the activists in those areas will be working with conflict to bring about change. But sometimes I think they don't, if they had more access to the kinds of things we know about how, how we can make conflict work for us, not that we have recipes, but we have signposts and thoughts and ideas and insights that might ease their path too. And in so doing, that would ease our path as well. So I'm going to uh, hand over to Vesna now uh, and ask her to say a little bit more in more depth about some of the areas uh, in the book, but which are also perhaps newer in terms of the field of conflict transformation. Vesna. Thank you, Simon. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. So I will give you a little, a brief overview of these new elements, new chapters Hello? in the World Conflict Toolbook. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. 
Okay, so the first one, the first new element is about healing, a topic that was absent in the first book. Avesna, can you hear? Yes, I can. No. Oh. Well, uh, Simon, I think it might be on your Good. computers. And can you hear now? Sorry, I have a raised hand. Um, let me make sure. I think I think the audio is all right. Um, that's not. I can hear you, so I would I would say continue, please. Okay, thank you. So the first chapter, the, the first uh, new element of the book is about healing, a topic that was absent in the first book, but which we see as a crucial one now. Our experience has shown that trauma healing and emotional well-being need to be integrated with development and peace work, and we show some ways of how it can be done. Another new element is learning, and this chapter assumes that however good our expertise and however wise our planning, the unpredictable will predictably occur. It therefore suggests different ways of meeting the crucial need to learn from what we do, to adapt, to reinvent our approach continually as we go. Then chapter eight is an extended chapter focusing mainly on dialogue and we try to identify those elements which will help to make it work. And then in chapter nine, we look at what happens when talking fails. It is focused mainly on movement building and how we can learn from the very mixed experience of recent years. So about the healing now. So it took a long while for those involved in peace building and development to realize that without proactive work on healing, the post-conflict work they were trying to do was almost impossible. These three areas of work, development, peace, and healing, have been compared to the three legs that a cooking pot needs to be stable. This chapter focuses on healing and presents some of the issues which need to be understood and considered when we are working in situations where violence, war, and ongoing oppression have created deep wounds which are psychological as well as physical. It offers a framework based on available evidence and experience, which can help us to integrate mental health and psychological well-being into work needed in our own particular situation, and to develop strategies adapted to our political, social, and cultural context. It emphasizes the, the importance of me, to mental health of people being able to say what they need and to take their own small steps to re-establish control over some parts of their lives as soon as this is possible. It questions the assumptions made when the whole populations are described as traumatized and highlights the potentially undermining effects of solutions imported from very different cultures and different contexts. The term healing is used to indicate that the discussion goes beyond a more medicalized and clinical men mental health approach and includes the healing of relationships and community. And then learning. Just waiting, okay, thank you. In this chapter, we look at the learning and the aspects that are crucial if we are to work effectively for change. Peace builders are much wiser now than they were 20 years ago, but we still don't know enough to guide us to maximum effectiveness in our own situation. So we have to work flexibly, getting regular rapid feedback to help check our plans and adapt them as necessary, both to failures and successes. We need, therefore, to become experts at learning, to become reflexive practitioners in all we do, we do combining what we know in general with what we need to know in particular situations. We do not act and learn alone. We learn as individuals, as members of communities and of organizations. Our learning needs to become part of a collective store of knowledge. We must develop a culture of learning where setbacks as well as achievements are acknowledged and failure is not hidden, but seen as an opportunity for learning. We must be flexible in facing and responding to unexpected events or the unanticipated consequences of our actions. Assessment and evaluation become part of the process, a move from evaluation as judgment to learning and liberation. Learning has many forms. In the book, we start with unlearning, and we discuss reflective practitioner approach, action learning, action research, training, monitoring, and evaluation. Sometimes when we talk of learning, we think of training, 
and there is a lot of training available in this field. What we do is we challenge the assumption that a short one-off workshop on conflict transformation or peace building or development will create an effective agent of change or will leave its participants with a lasting enhancement of their skills and knowledge. However, we cannot write off training because much of it is ineffective and poorly done. Training at its best is often an intervention as much as a preparation for action. And it can be highly effective and transformative. <clears throat> I'm struggling with my post-corona cough. <laughs> Sorry for that. <clears throat> So whatever vantage point you are coming from, it is likely the dialogue is one of your main options. It is versatile and can be adapted to almost any purpose. There seem to be as many varieties as there are organizations or groups using it. However, it is also a highly contested approach, certainly amongst peace builders. The wide range of forms of dialogue and its very adaptability may mean that it loses its core meaning and purpose. There is also skepticism about it, its effectiveness. It is well explained and described in theories, and there are plenty of case studies and accounts of practice. And yet, theory and practice tend to stay largely disconnected. So in this chapter, this chapter sets out with the assumption that we need to ask far-reaching questions about dialogue and how it is practiced. How exactly do we expect it to work? What impact can we reasonably expect? and how can we improve on what we are already doing. We explore some of the challenges of dialogue from our own practice, and we reflect on its potential in conflict transformation. And then mobilizing for change. So next slide, please. So with the best will in the world, we all know situations where dialogue and negotiation seem to be getting us nowhere. So what are our options then? One choice is to withdraw at that point. Another one is to keep on going with the same negotiations, even if they are leading nowhere. Another option is to recognize what the situation requires, some, that the situation requires something different, a strategy which is bolder and more adventurous and inevitably more risky. It is in some sense an explicit move from conflict resolution to conflict transformation. It is also a recognition that at the center of these choices lies power and the need to change the way it is currently held and exercised. In this chapter, we offer some, <coughs> excuse me, some examples of where these strategies have been tried more or less successfully <clears throat> and then look in some depth at how we ourselves can mobilize and build active and nonviolent movements for change locally, regionally, nationally, and beyond. And I will stop here and hand over to Bridget. The next slide, please. Can we have the next slide, please? <clears throat> Simon, next slide, please. You should have it. It's um, currently it says mobilizing for conflict. So I mean, sorry for change. I'm the complete opposite. Okay, thank you. <laughs> We've had a whirlwind tour and there's been lots to digest. Hello, I'm <laughs> welcome, and I hope you're not full of information. Um, this is our final slide, and it's really just a couple of points to take away. You'll have plenty of your own and plenty of questions to ask, and we want to keep time for that. Uh, but I thought that it would be helpful to pull out a couple of the points that have been covered already, particularly unlearning. And as Simon said, this is um, part of what we've had to do as reflective practitioners. But unlearning is something that's not just personal baggage, but I think also institutional baggage that needs to be looked at. And we need to ask ourselves, how do we recognize the need to unlearn and how do we do it? And with what results? And I think we have to recognize 
that we'll probably be in contested territory, whether it's about sexism, gender, racism, that unlearning is not a straightforward and easy process. It lands us in a place of struggle. And then Vesna has covered healing very fully, but it is something that I think has not been brought into peace practice in the past or has been seen separately or medically. And we need to ask ourselves, so what, what should we do where we are in our work? How do we include concepts of healing and what are they? And here, I think the question of unlearning comes in too, because every society has its own practices of healing and importing practices from elsewhere may be helpful, but it may not be helpful. And we need to be aware of this. So two things just to think about in addition to all the other learning. And finally, before I hand over for the question and answer session, we received a very moving piece from Christine Vertucci, who is a peace practitioner who with a cancer diagnosis was not able to go to a meeting in India. And so she talked a great deal about her message, which I think came down to peace builders really need to work together. We need to be ready to speak truth to power and whatever the context we are in, let us try and keep the flame of hope burning. Thank you. Over wonderful. to you. <laughs> That's, that is a wonderful way to uh, wrap up the presentation. Thank you so much, Simon, Vesna, and Bridget. Um, I just want to remind everyone, I'm going to go through how to submit questions um, now that we've reached our Q&A portion. Um, we will be, just a reminder that we will be sharing this presentation slot, the, sorry, many words. We will be sharing the presentation slides, important links, and this recording um, when we post the recording on the DME for Peace site, which will occur later this week. Um, and definitely by the start of next week. So now on to the Q&A portion of our discussion. A couple of notes about our format for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Thursday Talks. You can submit a question or comment in two ways. The first is through the question function. The second is to click on the hand icon and raise your hand, which will allow for me to unmute your microphone so you can ask the question live. When you submit your question for us, we ask that you try to submit your name and affiliation so we can attribute um, the question to you. And just as a note, these talks are recorded and posted on DME for Peace so that those who are not able to join us at this time can go back and listen to the presentation and discussion. Um, while everyone is sending in their own comments and questions, we actually have a couple already um, in. So I will start with those. And I also wanted to say that Mahamadou um, and Agnes, I see that you have raised your hands and I recognize that. I just want to um, make sure that you have time to formulate your questions. So I'm going to read off one question that we had written in and then I will get to unmuting both of you so you can ask your own question. So first we have a question about the content of the book. Um, Mohamud Haji is wondering if the book touches on violent conflict, specifically on terrorism and violent extremism. Uh, well, Mohamed, uh, this is Simon here. Um, thank you for your, your question. We certainly, we do touch on them and we look at the nature of violence, not only the violence that is occurring in terms of behavior, but also in terms of the structure and the attitudes that lie underneath it, both in terms of those who are involved in delivering terrorism, but also in those who, in, within whose societies terrorism uh, and so-called extremism happen. So um, we offer sort of conceptual ways of thinking about this and 
suggest that we do need to look at it systematically, that we do need to address our own uh, societies and structures every bit as much as uh, outside contexts. But in a way, I think, we, yes, we do try to offer those spaces to think about this and at the same time to realize that we have to find peaceful and nonviolent ways to challenge these, to resist them and to keep the, um, the alive, which are challenged by uh, the, the behavior of, of terrorism. I don't know whether my authors, co-authors want to add anything. Not me. Okay, I think we'll move on because we actually have a lot of questions being sent in and um, we have some of our participants want to ask the questions themselves. I'm going to unmute Mohamedou first. Um, Mohamedou, give me one second. Uh, you should be unmuted at this point if you would like to ask your, the question yourself. Okay, maybe I'll come back to you. Um, Agnes, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, Agnes, you're self-muted. If you could unmute yourself, um, then please feel free to ask your question. Okay, <laughs> maybe I'll just, let me continue to um, ask some of the questions that are being sent in and we'll get back to that. Um, so we have another, uh, we have quite a few questions in um, about, let me see here. Um, so Colin Jacobs asked if uh, you all could say a little bit more about unlearning in the context of institutions and how we can overcome these barriers. I say something uh, about that, or yes, do you please. want to, Simon? No, I suppose do, that, yeah, at the moment, I suppose in the UK, where I'm mainly involved, um, one of the societies that I'm part of is Quakers, a religious body, who are, I think, trying to both learn about their history in regard to chattel slavery and to unlearn habits institutionally that need to change if we are to become an anti-racist society so i think that's that's perhaps one example i know that um there's a conversation going on at the moment in the international development world about decolonizing development so uh, those would be two institutional examples i would give but as simon said i think we need to start from ourselves and be reflective practitioners in the situations we are in and then take that into our organizations. I believe Peace Direct is producing a report on decolonizing aid, something like that, decolonizing development. Okay, uh, wonderful. Um, I did want, sorry, thank you for that. I did want to say that um, Agnes, I do recognize, I do want you to be able to ask your own question. Um, I have unmuted you. It says that you are self-muted. Um, I'm sorry for the confusion in this. So, oh, there you are. Hi. Wonderful. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, thanks for joining us. And if you would like to ask your question now, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Agnes from Mamburi from Kenya and uh, Nakuru. Um, I want to appreciate that the book is recognizing that peace building is politicized. Uh, I want to thank the authors that they have realized that uh, trauma healing, uh, um, psychosocial support uh, is part of peace building and need to be entrenched within peace building. I'm a trauma healing counselor, uh, forgiveness and reconciliation practitioner. And uh, I've been practicing that since I started working for peace building uh, 2010, uh, after my training for one and a half years. And um, uh, what I'm currently doing, because uh, peace is politicized, 
after we had post-election violence 207 to eight, uh, we have issues which we cannot undo anymore. Children who participated or who uh, saw conflict are now in organized groups. A ready recipe for radicalization and uh, being recruited to uh, more uh, aggrieved, aggrieved, I would say, uh, let me call them aggrieved organized groups. So what I'm trying to do is uh, reaching out to the organized gangs, children and youth, and the majority of our schools in the informal settlements are already in the gangs. Even the teachers are working under very uh, scary environment within the schools. So I've been able to reach out to the government and convince them we can have we can do a pilot on character formation and we do forgiveness and reconciliation as a strategy to mitigate crime and violence among children and youth in most uh, who, who are mostly at risk of crime offenses and violence in the in the schools and also in the community so i want to appreciate the authors thank you so much for bringing what you have brought out I'm really delighted. God bless you. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you. Um, I at this moment I have um, lots, sorry I have lots of questions coming in. Um, there is one from Emmanuel Mola. Uh, Emmanuel is um, currently working in. Ethiopia. So um, keeping the situation that is happening in Ethiopia and that context in mind um, with this question, Emmanuel is asking, um, how do we support reconcile, uh, reconcile and healing? Um, and what would be the role of humanitarian and international institutions to turn a civil war into a uh, peaceful situation? Uh, Vesna, do you want to have a go at that? I, I, I can try if my voice is going to function at all. <clears throat> I think it's 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 very important question, but it's really something that I don't think we can offer any answer. But the only thing I, I think we can say that uh, in those situations, nothing can be done in isolation from the other activities. And that's why we were saying that healing is not working in itself and outside of the context and reconciliation cannot work without healing and peace building cannot work with other two so it's all part of the integrated bigger approach where we recognize that people are not traumatized because of themselves there is a context that, that is affecting them and the communities and the whole society um, cannot be proclaimed as sick or guilty or or, or at, in a way addressing them as somebody that needs to be changed is, is actually meaning that we are putting some kind of blame on them or, or, or identifying them as a as a problem rather than saying that this is the context socio-political context that the, 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 that is making people being traumatized and without acknowledging that and without addressing those issues i don't think we can make any 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 bigger impact for example some of our work in, uh, with, in ALERT in, in Rwanda um, started with combining reconciliation with psychosocial um, support, with dialogue, with the um, economic development, and only recognize that people cannot get into dialogue or they can't cooperate on economic uh, cooperation without actually starting with the healing and acknowledging what people went through and how communities are are affected so i think that was the, the message that we wanted to say that it needs to be acknowledged and our interventions need to be integrated with with um, all the other elements so humanitarian and development and peace building and healing needs to come together in a strategic way 
Thank you, Vesna. Um, uh, keeping in mind that I do recognize that we're getting close to our normal in time, um, we do have a lot of questions left, so I'm going to probably go over just a little bit in time. Um, we still probably will not get to everyone, um, but I just wanted you all to be aware that I am aware of this. Um, so our next question is from Ketty. Uh, Ketty asks, um, or Ketty says in regards to um, your statement that peace building work is often project based and obviously um, there is a huge competition over funds uh, Ketty is wondering how to in how do we integrate open discussions on failure in the organizational practice um, and in into the uh, communication with the donor community without affecting the reputation of the organization do you have any recommendations for that? That's such an interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> that at one level we need to preserve this sense that we're really working very effectively, pretty well everything is working, um, the log frame is, is fine, and here we are, we've delivered and now we want some more, and yet we know that so much has happened that we didn't expect. And I wonder if that isn't the space to open up with, with donors instead of going straight to this was a disaster, which is, you know, uh, which is also an important thing to, to build into the project proposals, the unexpected, the way things go differently and to make that a discussion with the donors from the start. If they really don't accept that, it really makes me wonder whether you can continue to honestly work with a funder who believes that you can start at January the 1st on the first year and end with December the 31st in three years and know what you were going to achieve and have achieved it. So it's it's about, I think, introducing that element of unexpectedness at the one hand. Um, and I think at another, it's about, and it's easy to say, but hard to do, the quality of the partnership that you have so that it isn't, it's based on honest, learning. I think the magic for me is shifting from this works to this is a huge source of learning. And uh, once you get to that, even uncomfortable and un quotes unsuccessful efforts become huge areas of learning. And if you can open that up with your donor and your partner, uh, I think it begins to become more acceptable to say, well, this really was unexpected and in some ways didn't work like we wanted, but it's led to such a lot of learning and here it is. And this is how we are sharing this with our partners. If I may add to that, um, it's um, <clears throat> something that is really now accepted also by donors and the, the whole community is uh, uh, thinking about conflict sensitivity, which has in itself this adaptability or uh, it's, it's involved in the, in the whole planning process that there will be things that will happen that we cannot predict and that we need to be uh, able and flexible and that we need to adapt to those, to those changes. So somehow saying um, that uh, something like conflict sensitivity becomes very in among donors and peace builders and development work is actually admitting that we can't predict everything, that there will be things that we don't know and that we are able and willing to learn from those uh, mistakes and challenges that are happening on our way can, can be one of the ways to somehow uh, overcome this, this, this obstacle of uh, projectizing and uh, log framing everything. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we probably really only have time for one more question, so I'm actually going to combine two, um, and we still won't get to all, and I, I will work hard to get these questions to our presenters, and hopefully um, we can continue the conversation, and the questions um, and, and dialogue can continue, of course, under the recording that we will post in the comment section. So we encourage you to uh, continue interacting there. So for our final double question, um, which comes uh, from Mia Saruku and uh, Iramosele Sylvester, and I want to thank you all for bearing with me as I um, inevitably mispronounce your names, and I apologize for that. But um, so uh, Iramosele asks um, originally, 
about um, is there anything in the book or could you briefly speak on um, combining traditional methods of conflict conflict resolution uh, specifically in Africa there are African traditional methods of resolving conflicts um, so does the book deal with combining or the intersection of these traditional ways of resolving conflict and then to add on that uh, Nia asked um, for a clarification between um, the difference between dialogue and negotiation um, which is a way of resolving conflict, so that is why I combine the two. Um, but if if any of you could speak on those, and I can clarify if you need me to uh, pose the questions again. Well, well, thank you for both those questions. If I start begin, uh, maybe Vesna or Bridget could pick up. Um, I think on the question of traditional approaches, customary approaches are point in the book the mantra we often say is start from where you are so where we are with the culture that we're in with the resources that we've got how do we deal with this looking at how we've dealt with things in the past and this is very much the you know traditional methodology where have where does the, where have those fallen down where do we need to strengthen them so we would begin with what's already there and explore i think as many of us do perhaps listening to this right now say well what else do we need here because the context has changed what else do we need to add i think it's probably fair to say that what often what comes under traditional ways of dealing with conflict on the african continent tend to like to um be of this of the let's all forgive and forget now and carry on they're stronger on the reconciliation than they are on changed behavior and changed systems in the system in the way in the situation that came about so it can lead to a continuing cycle of violence there's the kind of traditional smoothing over and then it continues so one of the things i think that one really needs to look at in terms of the, the more traditional cultural approaches is to what extent does it say never again? To what extent does it challenge things and shift onto a different ground? Um, but always start with the resources uh, that one has for, for those kinds of things, but be able to look critically at them. Vesna, yeah. did you want to come in on the second part of that question? Yeah, I can try. So <clears throat> if the question was about the difference between negotiation and, and dialogue, and I, I think in, in our chapter we are talking about dialogue and negotiation and mediation, but how we see dialogue is uh, something which is broader than negotiating directly between two parties, which usually have something as a problem, and then they try to find the solution. So it's, it's almost like a different language where we said people are negotiating, it's always about something or on what they're negotiating about. So you can have this win, win and lose um, outcomes of that. In dialogue, we talk about relationships, how to relate to each other, how to improve how people talk and who is talking and how they, um, uh, <clears throat> what issues they will bring in or, or, or not, what, what they're avoiding to talk about. So it's more about the relationship uh, among people and uh, if, we, if we talk about what can be the outcome of, of dialogue is to dialogue in itself can it, it's already an outcome because people come together and they start a conversation and it might be that they will improve their relationship and they will have this relationship uh, as something that can go beyond the dialogue process in which they might be able to come to some joint initiative or some sort of a, um, so, solution under quotes uh, for, for the immediate problem. But it's more broad, it's more open than negotiate negotiation process. And you know, there are also so many different kinds that it's very difficult to define uh, exactly what dialogue, what dialogue is. But this is how we see it, some, some potential for transforming relationships and for social change for individual transformation also 
this is how we see it. Thank you for that, Besna, and thank you, Simon. Um, at this point, I am gonna have to wrap things up, but um, I will reiterate, as said before, that I will collect the remaining questions and get them to our speakers, and we'll try to go from there. Um, so I just wanted to make a point before I say my final um, sign off that we did, I wanna recognize um, that we did get an overwhelming number of um, comments really being sent in, um, just stating how much our participants and audience um, value and have found all of our um, presenters' uh, previous works and the the original uh, working with conflict, how much value they've gotten from both your individual work and collective over the years and how much they appreciate um, all that you all have done. In addition, um, a lot of excitement around this new book. Um, we did have a question of if there will be uh, any training um, that being facilitated at any point. Um, so I will, I will let you, get that question to you all um, individually, but I just know there is a lot of excitement around the work that you are producing and that you have produced in the past. And I would want to acknowledge that we had a very large amount um, of that sort of message sent in. So um, saying goodbye, I wanted to say thank you all again for sending in your questions and thank you Agnes as well for sharing your experience live with us. Um, uh, a special thank you again to our hosts, Simon, Vesna, and Bridget. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this recording, presentation slides, and additional helpful uh, website links will be posted with the webinar recording on the DME for Peace site when we, um, by the end of this week, under the ME Thursday Talk section on the website. This is so that you are able to retor return to it and share it with your colleagues. Also, please feel free to continue the discussion online in the comment section. Um, so that is it for us today. And thank you all for staying with us. We'll be back um, in two weeks, actually, when we'll be talking with my colleagues and teammates over at Connexus, um, which is our new recently launched platform. Um, I'm actually going to drop the link for Connexus now into the chat to everyone. Um, so you know what I'm talking about if you don't already. Um, so Connexus uh, is inspired by the challenges presented by COVID-19. Um, Connexus was developed to create a collaborative environment for both peace builders, humanitarians, and development and the public health actors by focusing on real-time connections between practitioners, academics, and activists to help help address COVID response and beyond. I encourage you all to explore what Connexus has to offer, utilize its dynamic features, and connect with others working in your community. Well, that's it from me. Um, keep an eye out on our website and social media platforms for exact details on all of our upcoming ME Thursday talks and for the recording of our discussion today. I hope you all have a great rest of your day and thank you again for joining us, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Jennifer. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Bye, everyone. Bye. Great to share this with you.